This is Everyday Wellness, a podcast dedicated to helping you achieve your health and wellness goals and provide practical strategies that you can use in your real life. And now here are your hosts, clinical health psychologist, Dr. Kelly Donahue and nurse practitioner, Cynthia Thurlow. Excited today to have an incredibly special guest. This is Dr. Tom Moorcroft. He's a global leader in solving complex medical mysteries, and he is what he might call a medical detective. His goal is to find out what's really keeping people sick and help them get better, which involves combining the very best medical science available with an extensive experience in both the field, hospital, and his office, as well as a passion for supporting health and healing with simple, everyday, and often natural approaches so that you are as resilient and healthy as possible. I have them coming on today because there have been so many questions that I've been fielding with regard to COVID-19. He is a recognized uh, coronavirus, Lyme virus, mycotoxins expert, and I'm so grateful to have him on today. And let's be clear, he is jet lagged, just returning from a trip with his family. So we really need to be very grateful that he carved a little bit of time out of his busy schedule to meet with us today. Welcome, Tom. Hey Cynthia, thank you so much. It's a it's a pleasure to be here, and you know, thankfully, got a good night's sleep and feeling re- ready to go. So hopefully, we're over that jet lag. But <laughs> <laughs> I know it's right? it's hard. It's hard trying to find that balance. So let's dive in. I think a lot of what has struck people uh, with COVID nineteen or coronavirus is the fear of uncertainty, and so we recognize that we know that it's a, a, a name of respiratory illnesses caused by the 2019 novel coronavirus that was first discovered in Wuhan, China. Um, I've seen estimates of all the way up until November of 2019, but probably most popularly in December of 2019. And this is a compilation of viruses from a large family. They're named for the spikes on their surfaces that look like crowns. But let's dive right in. I know that you know here in the United States, um, it's been relatively recent, uh, and by relatively recent, I say it's been 2020 that we had our first confirmed case with it was January 20th, and it's actually taken 53 days uh, to administer testing that the South Koreans do in, in terms of volume in one whole day. Right. Uh, we know that on March 18th, the World Health Organization has declared it a pandemic, which means that it spanned two separate continents, and obviously it's continuing to grow. Here in my state of Virginia, uh, we had a declared state of re- emergency last week uh, and now have 30 confirmed cases and one death as of this morning. So it's continuing to grow. And, and I'd love for you to kind of touch on, you know, what has been your own experiences with COVID-19? Um, I know that you practice in the Northeast as well. Uh, and I know that you've been speaking on a lot of um, media events with regard to Corona as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the thing that it, there's so many things out there to talk about with this. And, and the, the one point that you really kind of highlight is that we are so far behind, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's, it's really sort of tragic because, um, and, you know, I want to start off and just say, I'm trying, I'm totally not an alarmist, right? Like I, (laughs) this is not, (laughs) I'm like, I'm so like, you know, just boost your immune system, Mm -hmm. get sleep, take, you know, it's your diet, it's your lifestyle. This is a real global emergency. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think the thing what we're seeing is, um, like you pointed out, we don't have testing available for anywhere near as many people who need it. And when, and we see that the numbers are just skyrocketing as we test more and more people. So I would like to see a a sort of a more uniform um, approach and let our, Mm -hmm. our politics and our egos go aside. And I'd like the leadership of our country to start standing up and saying, this is what's actually going on. You know, like, We've talked about Dr. Fauci and everything, and Mm -hmm. and I think he's really clear. You know, we need to start paying attention to what's going on. Mm -hmm. But paying attention and understanding what's really happening out there is different than panicking, Mm -hmm. right? And so I'm really advocating a proactive approach um, so that we don't have to panic. And unfortunately, despite coronavirus being respiratory illness, we can't get toilet paper anymore. Right. (laughs) (laughs) We're like, what have people been using up until this point? Yeah. Right. I, like, so, I mean, I think, I think the thing is um, it, it's most people, like most of the stats show about 80% of people are going to have, or more are going to have mild illness. It's going to be, you know, kind of a flu like illness. I mean, a lot of the symptoms that people um, report are 
you know, things like fever, cough, and shortness of breath, which, I mean, that sounds like a whole bunch of stuff you get in the winter. Mm -hmm. So, so now we have to kind of dive, you know, I I know we'll dive deeper into that, but it's one of these things where it's hard. Our, Our neighbor just came over to play with our daughter and we had to say, we're practicing social distancing right mm-hmm. now. Sorry, we can't do that. And back in January, that would have been complete, would have been seen as complete overkill. Mm-hmm. And right now, there's kind of two camps. One is that's absolutely necessary. And the other one is that's really still a little bit of overkill. But I think that the reality is shifting towards, we need to start taking this super seriously mm-hmm. and start to get the good information out there about how to help prevent ourselves from getting really sick if we're exposed and how to prevent exposure, which includes some of that distancing. And I think that's really hard for many of us to wrap our heads around because I, I can't think of a time in my adult life and, and I've worked in the healthcare environment for over 20 years where we've had to be that concerned, you know, certainly the post 9-11, and I, w- I know we were talking about this earlier, post 9-11 timeframe was navigating a tremendous amount of uncertainty as a healthcare provider and as a human being. But this is so very different trying to explain to our patient population, our friends and family, the things that we need to do to protect ourselves. And I have three introverts in my home and one extrovert, and the extrovert 12-year-old is not the least bit happy about having the inability to leave the house and go play with his friends, um, even at the park. And so that has been um, a huge, uh, probably painful realization for him uh, to have to kind of go through. And I said, this isn't forever, but for right now, this is what we need to do to be responsible. So you know, I think it's important to kind of talk about like how this virus is transmitted. I know that many of us know about droplets, uh, respiratory droplets and contact, but there's also some interesting data suggesting there could be a fecal oral transmission and and could help explain why, um, you know, cruise ships have become so hugely problematic for so many people. But I'd love for you to touch on, you know, the things in our environment that we need to be concerned about beyond just someone coughing on us or, you know, that six foot radius that we're recommending we keep between people that are not part of our household, because I think it it illustrates why it is so absolutely critical that we are on top of cleaning and maintaining and, and not becoming paranoid but just being very thoughtful about what we touch and what we touch, you know, with our hands or, you know, touching our faces, et cetera. Yeah. And I I think one of the most important things is to, to frame this part is that transmission is felt to be primarily from, or I should say what we've heard in the media is that transmission is a lot of times just from the most symptomatic people to other people who become symptomatic. And one, and one of the things that everyone's been touting is that children are not really being as affected mm-hmm. as some older adults. But the important part to understand is very much like influenza, there's this um, period of potential asymptomatic viral shed, which basically means I look fine, I feel fine, but I have the virus and I'm about to get sick, or maybe not, maybe I'm just carrying it, mm-hmm. but I can give it to somebody else. So we be, were concerned that some of this spread could also be our really healthy kids and our really healthy middle-aged people sharing it to others. So it's not just that we have to worry about the people who are obviously sick. Everybody has the potential to share it with someone else. And so I agree. So it's not always just the coffer. Mm-hmm. And it's not always like I did an art. Um, I worked with a reporter on an article for, hey, should I go to the gym? <laughs> and we did the, you know, I talked to her on Tuesday and, and, and a couple, you know, within five days, everything's different. But the mm-hmm. bottom line was you have to be aware that the coronavirus could be spread by people who aren't sick. And also it can be on the surfaces. So mm-hmm. as you mentioned, a lot of the different surfaces that are available out there, you know, um, depending upon how porous they are versus how hard they are, the virus may live for quite a while. And, um, you know, again, a week ago, we were all saying, hey, coronavirus can can be infective on a surface for a few hours up to maybe 48 hours. Mm-hmm. And every time I mentioned 48 hours, everybody flipped out. They almost fell out of their chair. <laughs> like, what? That's really long. <laughs> yeah. And now, a week later, we're we're having research that certain surfaces may even be seven or nine days. Yeah. You know, we don't, and, and this is the thing, as a, as a healthcare provider, I've always prided myself on being okay with saying, I don't know. 
Mm-hmm. And this is the time where all healthcare providers got to get real comfortable with that one because yeah. we don't really know what's going on. So um, the vast majority of probably um, surface transmission is most likely going to be happening in the first couple of days. But a- as we were talking before, it's like even um, cardboard might mm-hmm. be a day. Yeah, yeah. So when we're getting our packages, like we all think we're smooth, we're ordering online and we're <laughs> great. So we don't have to, you know, we can put it on our front porch and then we're right. going to open it. This is, so this is a great time to practice washing your hands before you mm-hmm. open something up, open it up in a confined, in an area that you're going to use as your confined containment area. And then after you open the box, before you take the stuff out, go rewash your hands. Mm-hmm. Like when I was recently traveling, as you mentioned, it was like everybody had these gloves on and they're touching <laughs> everything. And the flight attendants, they have their gloves on and they're like, oh, we're protecting everybody because we have our gloves on. I'm like, no, actually it's the same as your hands. You're protecting yourself, mm-hmm. but you're touching everything else with, with potentially dirty hands. So we have to understand that like what we touch and then go touch something else, we can move things around. And so it's just a, it's, 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 it's a part of that hysteria. So again, let's back up and say, you know, if our hands are, are not all cut up, we're most likely, because we can have microscopic cuts, but we're most mm-hmm. likely protected, but you don't want to open something, dive into it and then put it on your counter and then go wash your mm-hmm. hands. You know, it's when you touch the potentially contaminated area, now stop and clean up and then take the things out. You know, it's just almost like, it's almost like for those of us that are healthcare providers, you know, creating a sterile field, you know, years ago that you would literally just be like, I can't put my hand over the sterile field. It's like all of a sudden, all those, those, um, you know, those memories come flooding back. There was interestingly enough on Twitter today, someone was passing along a video that was from the, the show Scrubs from years ago. And it was <laughs> demonstrating how, you know, someone's hand would turn green when it got dirty. And then it would show you how many other things they touch, which then became green because they had been contaminated. And I think for a lot of the lay public, they aren't as accustomed to having to be as conscientious, perhaps as someone that works in the healthcare environment. But I want to rattle yeah. off some statistics that I found really enlightening. So we know that Corona or COVID-19 can last three hours in the air, four hours on copper, 24 hours on cardboard. So all of us think we're being super smooth with our Amazon Prime boxes. (laughs) Gives you a whole other way to think about it. Two to three days on plastics and stainless steel with upwards of nine days on plastic, metal, and ceramics. So think about the downward effect, doorknobs, tables, elevator buttons. And last but not least, um, feces and urine one to two days and then diarrhea, which has a different pH level up to four days. So you want to make sure that your toilets and everything else in your house are really kept super clean. I live in a house where I'm the only female, so I'm on top of this anyway, but I'm just saying now I'm even being a little more OCD. So (laughs) just something to consider. Yeah. And it is. And it's interesting. If you look back at what we've all been recommending, um, throughout the sort of the initial stages is, any high touch area. Mm-hmm. And, and again, it doesn't have to be high touch with your hands. It could be your butt, <laughs> right? <laughs> it is, should be wiped down at least once a day. Yep. And, you know, and, and it's nice. I mean, I, I give it to you. Traveling was actually really interesting because you could see they were delaying the flights a little bit, which is mm-hmm. good because now they've put such a big buffer on either end. They're never late. Right. Um, you can leave 45 minutes late and arrive early. So that's good. <laughs> um, but they were, they were wiping down all the, they were spraying down like all the seats, all the tray tables. Oh, that's I great. mean, it was, they, you know, it's interesting because this is one of the times where I feel the medical community leaving the politicians out of this discussion, mm-hmm. but the actual medical community has been pretty good at say, be proactive and also common sense. So mm-hmm. we've been telling people in like, wipe things down more frequently than once a day. If you're in a public area, you know, Mm -hmm. use common sense here. Um, and, and it is, it's, it's scary because we don't really know. And like I said, even five, six days ago, the transmission data was not as clear as it is right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the other startling statistics about this is, um, you know, there's a great article on medium, a couple days ago that came out about what's really going on with the numbers mm-hmm. of what we're finding and what the true cases are. And we know that because testing has been delayed in the US because we needed to do it ourselves instead of relying on help from the WHO who had a test and tons of them. Um, but what we do know 
is that um, a lot of the new cases are because we're testing a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But the other part is we are at a point in time where on average, every two days, we're going to see a doubling Mm -hmm. of the number of cases in the United States. And if you go and you look on the CDC website, you see one number. And then as the weekend comes when they don't update it, because they don't update it on the weekends, Mm -hmm. but you track the, the numbers from the WHO and other organizations Two days ago, we are now double that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this is going to be, testing is catching up, but it's also, some of it's going to, we're going to see a lot of it is new cases. Um, And a lot of people are concerned because, again, the the variability in the the statistics, mortality has been estimated from 1% to 4.5%. And the global rate has been right around three and a half percent with some fluctuations. But we're hoping in the United States, our mortality rate comes down as we find more and more and more cases of this. Mm -hmm. But the reality is we don't know. And I mean, for an infection um, of this magnitude to have even a one percent mortality rate is is unreal. I mean, that's humongous. It really is. It really is. And and I think. You know, it speaks to, you know, I have colleagues that are in Italy and, you know, being under essentially martial law, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's been very humbling for them. uh, And they're hoping that, you know, what we're seeing in Seattle does not evolve into, you know, little Italy, literally. Um, I I know that, you know, we're going to touch on some of these things, but the lack of access to supplies for a lot of healthcare providers, I know is becoming hugely problematic. I'm, I'm watching friends talk about how they have to reuse masks and, and things like that. And, and I know that's a whole other separate topic that we'll get to, but yeah, yeah. Um, oh. I, I just don't think uh, most of us were as prepared for this um, as we, as we had hoped we would be oh, when the time and came. I, you know, and not to belabor it, but I do think it's a really important point is we need clear leadership on this one. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just heard that the president finally agreed to be tested. But a day ago, it was like, oh, the, your doctor says you don't need a test. Well, now I've been tested and I've gotten results back faster than anybody who has ever been tested before. I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, this is part of the pa- part of the panic is because we haven't been clear mm-hmm. on what we really need to do and what to expect. And it's like, I have friends sending me photos all the time of like, this is Walmart, nothing. Whole Foods has no food. The local mm-hmm. grocery store, I'm like... And people, the only thing you can really get are fresh vegetables and 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 meats, which because everybody thinks they're going to die from having fresh vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, the, you know, we don't need to become what is it like doomsday, whatever mm-hmm. the people are who build, you know, building caves underground. <laughs> we, we really don't, but we do have to understand that hanging out at home and doing some of our work, you know via a teleconference might be sort of the norm for the next little while, but we can still take a breath and do the things like you said, like go to the supermarket at an off hour, have a plan and don't buy everything under the sun, just buy the things you need. Unfortunately, this is where a lot of the, the lack of early leadership has led to this sort of hysteria. We've made this pandemic worse Mm -hmm. because now when I go to the store, I have to buy extra stuff because there's nothing there. Right. You know, right. And, and even the Whole Foods folks yesterday were telling us that they're being rationed how much they can. Oh, like, interesting. Yeah. That- like my wife came home and said, like, they literally said there's only so much food that they're allowed to put out any given day. Wow. Or be shipped. Wow. I'm like, we do not have a world food shortage any more than we did in, Jan- in the beginning Correct. of January, right? Correct. I mean, but it's everybody's flipping and hoarding. Yeah. And, and this is a part where we're, that's our, that, that, you know, sort of horse is already out of the barn. So we have to figure out we're, you know, and I think it is clear messaging and also getting a better control under this. I mean, if we can start to, in the U S like, it's amazing. All these major organizations, Nike and Apple and everybody else are closing down their stores yeah. to help. And if we can get ahead of this, I mean, the coronavirus is going to be here. One of the, you know, and we're hoping that there might be a seasonal variation like with the flu where we have a reprieve in the summer mm-hmm. months to kind of catch up. Unfortunately, that probably means it'll become more Southern hemisphere and then come back up mm-hmm. here next fall, yeah. which is a whole nother story. <laughs> the question is, are we just going to see this exponentially rise like in Italy or can we, by all banding together and using some of this social distancing and some of these other 
things that we've been talking about, can we can control the, the increase and put it sort of flatten the curve? A lot mm -hmm. of people have been talking about, and if we can bring down that rise so that, you know, some of the treatments people are working on and some of the, maybe the summer and all these other things can help us, that's going to be, and we'll know in the next four to six weeks, really where that's all going to be. Exactly. And I think those are such good points. And it's it's interesting. We were speaking before I, we jumped on uh, the recording and I was saying, trying to explain to my children that my strategy, if I have to go to the grocery store is as follows. I go when it opens and there's usually not many people there and I get what I need and I get out and I go home and I, I usually do self-checkout and that's how I do it. I have two, you know, I, I'm all about being a realist and I have a tween and a tween, a teen and a tween boys who eat twice as much food as I do. And I have a healthy appetite. And so the only way to stay ahead of the curve is we have a lot, we have two refrigerators. So I'm stocking up on meat and as many vegetables as I can. And then to their great delight, we have a lot of cauliflower crust pizzas and mac and cheese, which we never normally have. But I was like, listen, I'm a, I'm a realist. And I, if we're going to be homebound, then I need to like, just have to appease everyone. Right. But let's pivot a little bit and let's talk about the comorbidities or the risk factors for um, having more complications or being more susceptible to contracting COVID-19. And from my reading, it looks like in China in particular, you know, they have a larger proportion of males in particular that smoke. So smoking actually makes you more susceptible as well as obesity. Uh, and, you know, the bulk of our adult population here in the United States has that as an issue. And then obviously age. So age greater than 60, those individuals appear to be more susceptible to having a more severe case um, or complications from COVID-19 than the rest of us. So I'd love for you to kind of dive into what you feel are some of the other, or are some of the, you know, biggest risk factors or comorbidities for complications. Yeah. I mean, I think that those are, are huge ones. And I think that it's really, uh, even a few days ago, we weren't talking about the lifestyle piece. I mean, we were obviously, yeah. <laughs> yes. but the, the, the broader conversation mm -hmm. didn't say smoking and obesity. Yeah. So the standard ones are asthma, mm -hmm. lung disease, diabetes, especially uncontrolled diabetes, which is yeah. frequently because of obesity and smoking, um, but also heart disease. Yeah. And so this is an interesting thing because then you go to pivot to that age piece and it's interesting, if you look across the curve, like you'll see like little kids, like, you know, almost nothing, zero to 2% of mm -hmm. problems, you know, low infection rates. And each age group, we go up every increment of 10, mm -hmm. you know, you get in your twenties and thirties, there's a little blip. And then around 60 is like you said, it's where you get mm -hmm. that extra blip and there's a change, there's an inflection yeah. point. But then if you go from like 50 to 60, it's a bit of a change. But when you go from 60 to 70, oh, yeah. It's massive. And when you yeah. go to 80, yeah. so 80 is the average age of death um, mm -hmm. from COVID-19 at the moment. It just skyrockets. Mm -hmm. And so I was actually asked by somebody the other day, uh, one of the reporters that I was talking to on the news, and she said, hey, you know, my, both my parents are in Florida. They're 80 years old. They both have diabetes. And uh, we live in New York City and my kids are fine. My kids want to go visit them next week. I was like, no, 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 way. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> I mean, because this is a great example of even if you live around the corner, like I'm thinking about my, my father-in-law. He was a longtime drinker and smoker, totally cleaned up his act 20 years ago, but the damage is done to his mm -hmm. heart. He's got some cardiomyopathy, recently oh, wow. had a heart attack. He's done it. Literally, he changed his entire life. And I'm so mm -hmm. proud of the guy. But, and, but it's so important to understand that we can't go visit him right now. Mm -hmm. It's really right? hard. Because, and it is. And he's got, you know, four grandchildren, all of whom live within 20 minutes. They all want to, we're a very close knit family. And we're like, we're not going because mm -hmm. our children and like Jill and I, I mean, we spend so much time focusing on our health, but we just traveled. I mean, I, I could be completely healthy and I could mm -hmm. kill him. Right. And exactly. so I, I know we talked about this a little and I don't want to go back to that, but it's just so important to understand that some of our risk factors are risk factors based on proximity. So we mm -hmm. have to just think beyond just our personal risk factor and those risk factors to others. Um, and this is primarily, primarily a lower respiratory infection, mm -hmm. right? So anybody who's had lung issues, like, I mean, I was just hanging out with a guy who's got COPD. I mean, I didn't know he would have, I didn't think he would have come to the event, right. but, you know, but that's, you know, I found that out and I'm like, we have to keep him healthy. And so 
COPD, emphysema, asthma, you know, any sort of chronic lung disease are going to be like big red flags and Mm -hmm. then some of those others as well. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's a question that has kept coming up over and over again. You know, those who are immunocompromised, like my mother-in-law who lives in Texas, she is status post a renal transplant from 30 years ago. And we were having to explain to her that, you know, my, my husband was going to be in town and I indicated, you know, there's no way that he can go visit her. Um, And then also people that have got chronic autoimmune disorders. So whether it's Hashimoto's or Crohn's or rheumatoid arthritis, I mean, those individuals, um, and especially if their autoimmune disorders are not uh, well controlled, uh, you know, people with psoriasis, I always use that as a good example. There are also people that, you know, that gut health, that immunity piece can really be problematic. So just making sure they're doing all the things that they can be doing to lower their risk of um, contracting COVID-19. Now, I'd love to pivot a little bit. I know that I've gotten a lot of questions about um, what is the standard treatment? So if you get sick enough that you need to go to the hospital, you know, based on your reading and, and your, um, you know, research that you've been able to do, what, uh, what are they typically using for people when they're sick enough to need to be hospitalized? Yeah. Um, well, the, the, the hospitalized treatment primarily is containment, you know, mm-hmm. and supportive care. So what that means in a hospital is if you're, if you're severe enough to need sort of critical care, you know, or you're, you know, you've gotten, you know, you have low oxygen levels, respiratory distress, we're we're probably going to put you in what we call a negative pressure room so that we can actually like be pulling the air out and filtering it so Mm -hmm. that like the air is not being blown out under the door. It's actually Mm -hmm. being sucked in and cleaned. Um, But we're running out of that. Yeah. Um, a lot of the respiratory, a lot of what we do is called supportive care. So if you're not breathing well enough, we may have to support your breathing. There's multiple different ways to do that. Some of it's like the breathing ventilator machine that mm-hmm. is the scary stuff you always see on the TV shows. Um, and some of it's a little you know, less extreme, but that's really what it is. And um, we don't have any really good medical treatments at the moment. Um, they're in California and, and, and Seattle and some of the other areas in the West, they've been looking at um, a drug called remdesivir, mm-hmm. which is an antiviral that was actually uh, designed originally to be used in Ebola, mm-hmm. um, but it was a miserable failure <laughs> in <laughs> Ebola. But the good news is because of the way it works, scientists thought that maybe it would work in COVID-19. And so the FDA has granted some compassionate use um, exemptions for people. And it's actually for the doctors who are reporting using it in, in the real, most severe people, it, it, it can sometimes lead to very miraculous changes. Now the problem is it's a really small group of people. And a lot of times what you do is you're in the middle of an epidemic and you throw a bunch of drugs at the worst people. And mm-hmm. then they happen to all have gotten it at the exact same place. And they have the same little strain and they all look like it's a miracle. Mm -hmm. When we start to do bigger trials and we look at it more globally, it doesn't always pan out. And that's, that's essentially what happened when they started treating Ebola. So Mm -hmm. we'll see what happens, but there are clinical trials, but, but don't be planning on this stuff being available anytime soon. I mean, the, as, um, about a week ago, they said it's going to take another month to start the clinical trials and clinical trials take months and months and months. They've stepped it up, though, I think, to phase three. So we only do a three and a four rather than one, two, three, four mm-hmm. at this point. Yeah. <laughs> but it'll be a while. Unfortunately, there's no oral form at the moment. It's only IV. There are um, you know, hydroxychloroquine and, and uh, chloroquine and some other drugs that have been used, like we were talking earlier about in, in uh, malaria mm-hmm. um, prevention and treatment have been used. Um, in SARS, which is another coronavirus um, from back in the early 2000s, um, there's some uh, test tube studies that were done in petri dish work in the science lab that said um, an oral drug called Alinea or, or natazoxanide um, might be effective. We have no evidence it works in COVID-19, but it's a low risk. Um, you know, it's a very, it has low side effects. I mean, sure. it's like almost worse. It's almost worse to have a Tic Tac than, than this Alinea. <laughs> so some people are considering that um, as a possible oral trial, but the truth is we don't have any we don't have any studies on any of those. Um, so I think the most important things are to do the stuff that I know you talk about and a lot of mm-hmm. our friends are talking about is let's naturally boost our immune system now. And then if we do get sick, there are some natural things that can help. Just because they haven't been tested 
doesn't mean we're not going to do it. And like my wife said to me the other day, she goes, Hey, you know, yeah, I know the Alinity has not been tested, but if you got it, wouldn't you be doing it? (laughs) Well, we'll see. (laughs) I like the way she thinks. She's a smart woman. But I think there's no doubt about that. Yeah, no, but I think it's really, I I would say the bulk of uh, the podcast listeners are really like super interested in what we're going to talk about in terms of modulating the immune system, ways that we can proactively do that and and do it with things that, you know, we can either get through our healthcare provider or we can find on our own. And I think probably, I always say like one of my favorite, um, my favorite uh, immunity boosters is vitamin D3. So we know that it's a pro-survival molecule. It's anti-inflammatory. Um, I think what's most significant is most of us are deficient in D3 for a multiplicity of reasons, especially in the colder months. And so, you know, if your values are less than 30, you're much more susceptible to, um, you know, complications from any illness. But I normally like to see the numbers between 50 and 80. And I know for myself, I usually like to kind of give vitamin D3 along with vitamin A, um, mm-hmm. which I know also can bolster immune function and can impact some of the beneficial bacteria um, in the so, large intestine as well. Have you seen, um, do you do, uh, I'm sure you're aware of the vitamin D hammer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, is that something that you've seen? <laughs> I, I have folks? seen. I have seen. Yes. I've oh, used no. it and it seems to work on me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I was telling my kids that uh, it's the one supplement they don't get a choice on taking. Like, right. I don't care if you want the drops. I don't care if you want the supplement pill. You're taking it because we need to increase the likelihood because we can't get enough sun exposure in Washington, D.C. this time oh, of no. year. And it has um, to be D3. It's not the fortified foods with the correct. D2 and all this. It really needs to be D3. And I, I've never seen anybody who takes 5,000 a day become toxic. In fact, I've seen people taking 20,000 a day not under my recommendation, but they've done it and they haven't become toxic. And I think in the short run, yes, it's fat soluble. Yes, it's, Mm -hmm. it's, it, you could become toxic and cause problems. Very unlikely for most adults listening that 5,000, you know, again, check with your healthcare practitioner and all this stuff, since I'm not allowed to tell you what to do, but if I don't know you, but you know, there is testing available direct to consumer to make sure your levels aren't too high. Your kids can use a little bit less, but I mean, certainly my whole family is taking five. And like when we went away recently, I mean, I just, I would, right before I left, I put a 10,000 in with my 5,000 mm-hmm. and every day I was gone, I took an extra 10,000 on top of my 5,000 that had the mm-hmm. K in it as well. Yep. And, you know, and I've done summers where I'm out riding my bike all the time at levels of 10,000 every day and never became toxic, never really got over yeah. 105. Your body loves this stuff and it's such an underutilized immune support. Hi all, it's Kelly. I wanted to jump in and talk about CBD. I'm sure by now you've heard us or other people talk about the benefits of using CBD oil and related products. And I'm telling you that it definitely works and the research is supporting that. However, Cynthia and I have also noticed that you can purchase what's labeled as CBD oil from drugstores, from gas stations, and we wanna make sure that if you're going to try this product, that you have a really good, reliable source. Direct CBD Online provides natural alternatives to prescription painkillers and medications. They sell only the highest quality CBD oils, edibles, creams, and more to help you on your search for natural well-being. And they strive to assist you in making informed decisions about your health and the products and supplements that you use. If you've been thinking about trying CBD, and we know that you have, I highly encourage you to check out Direct CBD online. You can click the link in the description to learn more and get started today. It really is. And I, and the other one that I really like, and, and most people probably know that I was supposed to be in Asia, I would have been flying back from Japan today. Um, <laughs> but my trip was canceled three days before I was supposed to leave. And I was getting high dose vitamin C before I left, which you know, is an antioxidant, uh, reduces inflammation, uh, and can be hugely beneficial for immunity. And so I was getting 25,000 units around my trip. Uh, unfortunately, which I didn't get to go on and would not have been appropriate to go on given the current situation there. Yeah. Um, but I'd love, do you, do you routinely recommend vitamin C to your patients? Is that something that. So on a, on a general everyday basis, I'm kind of like pretty lackadaisical about vitamin C to be Mm -hmm. completely honest. I mean, it's just one where my chronically infected patients tend to have Mm -hmm. a lot of other 
um, immune dysfunction and other nutritional deficiencies that when mm -hmm. I get them to address that, they start to absorb a lot more C out of their diet. Now, what we're talking about right now is a little bit of a different scenario, right? Mm -hmm. And um, certainly I should say, I do use high dose IV vitamin C for multiple different reasons in our, in our practice. I would, I, you know, and this is one of the things where um, the WHO and a lot of the big internet giants have gotten together and censored some of the conversation about mm -hmm. vitamin C, at least that's what I've, what they report themselves mm -hmm. in the media. But uh, I'm vitamin C is a very effective um, antioxidant at lower doses. But as you increase the dosage, it becomes an oxidative stressor. Mm -hmm. It becomes an oxidant. And that's how we're killing a lot of these bacteria. Mm -hmm. This is how we're inactivating a lot of these viruses. And so um, there's been work forever showing that vitamin C in high doses given by a provider who knows what they're doing and has experience can potentially you know, really short, shorten out viral illnesses. Um, so, um, again, it goes back to what my wife and I were talking about. She was just like, well, if you were sick, wouldn't you take that? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> but now the problem is what if some of our patients get coronavirus and we don't have it? Mm -hmm. My office is not set up with a negative pressure room. We're, we're not fit for the medical masks appropriately. I, when I worked in the hospital, I was sized and I had yeah. the one that was perfectly form fit to Tom. But now that I have a, a practice, it's like, does it make sense to bring them in? And so yeah. one of the things I've been having people do is start now with, a, you know, maybe 500 vitamin C twice a day, working their way up slowly to about 2000, mm -hmm. you know, because it can have a laxative effect. Sure. And then you off, and then if you get sick, you can certainly bump it up to, I mean, it's safe. I mean, the only thing you're really going to do is cause diarrhea, yeah. Yeah. which as you pointed out, might not be a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the one other trick might be there's some liposomal or fat bound mm -hmm. vitamin C available. Those are um, typically liposomes or four to five times more absorbable out of the gut. So as an example, if you were able to tolerate 5,000 or, or sorry, 500 um, milligrams of vitamin C twice a day, that would be equivalent to, uh, of the liposome would mm -hmm. be equivalent to approximately 2,500. So some people can, can utilize that. I'm sure there's going to be run on it and <laughs> there won't be any available. <laughs> well, I know on full script, I, I had, uh, so I have a very small clinical practice. And so I, I reached out to all of my patients and said, if anyone's concerned about, you know, some of the things we can do proactively to boost immunity, these are my recommendations. And honest to goodness, by the time most of them got around to ordering stuff for themselves, everything that were my go-to were just gone, you know, even if it was yeah. vitamin D3. So clearly people are kind of jumping on this bandwagon, liposomal vitamin C, um, you know, products like Viracet that's made by Orthomolecular, which is right. one of my favorite things to kind of travel with. But what are some of your other kind of go-tos? Yeah. I, I know for you in particular, because you have a lot of Lyme patients, um, you know, people that have got secondary tertiary Lyme, but for, for those who are dealing with an acute uh, insult or are, you know, trying to bolster immunity at this point, what are some of your other go-tos that you enjoy using? Yeah. I mean, I have people, especially because I also see a lot of kids with autoimmune encephalitis, mm -hmm. like pans and pandas. And one of the tricks we use just typically to keep them from getting recurrent viral illnesses is biocide and throat spray. Hmm. And so biocidin is a really potent antimicrobial, antifungal, antiviral, antibacterial. It's great in um, both Lyme and mycotoxins taken orally. But I also, in the spray form, coats the back of your throat. And a lot of people talk about like guarding the gate, meaning mm -hmm. we're, we're a lot of these infections that trigger our kids with this autoimmune encephalitis, where just a lot of us to get sick are coming in through our nose and our mouth. Mm -hmm. So if we can coat the back of our throat a couple times a day, so I did that when I traveled and, and, I, and I, I find it, I've been using it for years that way. So the Biosyn throat spray is good. They also, Biobotanical Research has a product called Allovirex, mm -hmm. which is kind of a, it's great for rebuilding the gut and it's a great immune supporter. That works really well. Um, I've also been using, there's some decent evidence, well, not, very good evidence on immune support from Research Nutritionals makes transfer factor multi-immune. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I've used for a long time. It's been very helpful. A lot of the other things like their transfer factor, like Lyme Plus and all these other things, I haven't seen as effective, but just for a general boost of the immune system, the multi-immune has been really good. And so like for adults, like I've been taking three a day, like just first thing in the morning um, or, or at lunch if I'm fasting that day. But um, when I traveled, it was three twice a day just to, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Just to make sure you get it all in. Yeah. Um, The other thing is probiotics too. mm -hmm. I mean, and and there's a gazillion different opinions out there about what you should do and whatever. I use a lot of Theralac because it's wonderful from master supplements. It's wonderful in um, people with, um, who are on antibiotics to or needing to reboot their gut uh, build, rebuild after the antibiotics, but um, any, any sort of you know broad spectrum strain specific you know probiotic, it's, it's you know get the gut balanced now. Yeah, so you're using more soil based as opposed to spore based probiotics. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, definitely. There's now, I get a lot of questions about that in particular. You know, it, it was interesting when I was doing this this search and really looking, you know, things that came up pretty frequently were zinc, um, monolaurin, uh, which mm-hmm. is coconut lauric acid, uh, things like olive leaf extract, even ozone therapy and peptide therapies, which right. I'll be completely upfront, ozone therapy and peptides are not <laughs> my area of expertise. I do know colleagues that that use those therapies. Right. Um, and use them uh, with some frequency, but definitely there's lots of lots of opinions. Obviously, having to navigate this and working with someone that uh, is knowledgeable and also understands your own, you know, personal history yeah. is really critical. Now, and, and will it be available? You know, because like, yes, I mean, peptides make sense. Somebody who knows ozone makes sense, but is it available? And is it even reasonable to give to somebody who's mildly sick when Correct. they're going to get most likely get better and ri- but risk exposing? A time entire work. office. And, and it's an individual discussion with your provider for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Now I'd love to deep dive into, you know, we got a lot of questions, you know, when I mentioned that we were going to be speaking today, people were asking lots of questions, what can they do to help and what should they not be doing? And so, you know, when I was kind of putting things together and we were talking earlier about um, some reports that, you know, being in a sauna or using a blow dryer near your your nose, uh, because there's some evidence to show that uh, the temperature of 133 Fahrenheit will kill coronavirus. You know, it was used as the Achilles heel. You know that that that, that temperature in particular will kill 10,000 units of coronavirus mm-hmm. in 15 minutes. Uh, but I don't know anyone I would recommend that they have a hair dryer near their nose. I think you'd end up getting a, a burn of some kind. And you know, same thing with the sauna. I mean, I I don't know if I would recommend that people be in a sauna for 30 minutes uh, if they're you know with all the other things that are going, unless they have their own personal sauna in their own house. Right. So. And they have one for each individual person and they Correct. don't share it, right? I mean, it's like... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I think all of it's interesting. So much of our, our science, though, comes out of laboratory research. Mm-hmm. And, and we have very little clinical evidence other than what most people are seeing on the news, with the coronavirus. Um, and so... I read a lot about the hair dryer up your nose thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, could you try it? Sure. Does it make, <laughs> does it make sense? Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Kind of. But, but the problem is there's so many people who use a sauna, which can do the same thing on mm-hmm. a regular basis and they can still get viral illnesses. Right. Um, and the other thing is I'm a little concerned about people making drastic changes in mm-hmm. this pandemic, just like we lost, we ran out of all our toilet paper and most of our food. What we really need to do is make <laughs> small, consistent changes right. that are going to boost our health long-term. And we do, and we use the coronavirus epide- pandemic to um, be our motivator, right? you know, because I mean, if you get, as an adult, we all need eight or nine hours of sleep, you know, 99% of us, despite what most people, oh, I can make it on four. That's not no, what can't. the science shows. No, you can't. And we need to sleep. And our kids need more than that. Mm-hmm. You know, and if you can get eight or nine hours of sleep at night, you're gonna get the health benefits of that are gonna be so much more than putting a blow dryer up your nose. <laughs> and, yes. and, and a lot of like they're saying, oh, well, everybody's getting better quickly when you do that protocol. I'm like, well, that that's a good idea, but most people are getting better in a week or two. Mm-hmm. from coronavirus right so and we don't know does it the person that i read who wrote a book on this is saying that we're killing the virus i'm like well it's not alive so it can't be killed right and so I, i'm just I, I think that we have to just be careful in that and so for me the big things are sleep mm-hmm. you know which includes turning the lights down earlier you know um turning the tv off and the tablets off a little earlier so we can get into sleep uh, if you do need to be in front of a screen or with the lights on at night, using blue blocker lenses mm-hmm. to help 
minimize the negative impacts of the blue light in, in all these light sources on our circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. Because melatonin, which is a primary, you know, requires sunlight um, or light in the same frequency of light in the morning to start creating it and then darkness to release melatonin. Mm -hmm. Melatonin is profoundly immune supporting and profoundly, profoundly antioxidative. So it's a great antioxidant and, and it's just so important. Um, and one of the other things that I find, and it's so interesting, so many people are resistant. They're, they're, they'll go out and buy a dust mask to go out in public, which we know doesn't work at all. Correct. But, but, and, but they won't turn off their Wi-Fi. And one and of the most huge. important- turn it off, you know, because it de that extra electricity shooting through your body at night leads to inflammation. Now, can we get rid of Wi-Fi in 2020? Probably not. But if you turn off your router at night, it's a distance situation. So yes, your, your neighbors still might be red in your house, but the one in your house is going to be a lot worse for you. So mm -hmm. I tell people to actually go get a, this is, hopefully we'll have a run on uh, timers at Home Depot and Lowe's, right? Yeah. And Amazon, let's get timers, plug our Wi-Fi router into a timer and then set it for like 10 PM and set it to go back mm -hmm. on at like seven or whatever yeah. the hours are. And then that way you automatically lose your ability to use your tablet too late, at least on the Wi-Fi part. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's a good thing to help you get a lot more sleep. People with chronic insomnia often report in a week or two, they're sleeping much more deeply just by turning that off. Yeah. And we know it dysregulates cortisol. So I remind people that if you're having trouble sleeping, there's a lot of different hacks that you can do that don't really cost anything. And turning off your Wi-Fi is huge. Like everyone laughs that my computer in my office is wired into the wall. And I said, well, because it makes my life so much easier, um, so much easier. But I also right. think about things like um, using saline nasal spray, especially yep. after flying. That was something that I was doing when I was still flying, which I haven't flown in the last two weeks. Um, I think about, you know, we're talking about social distancing, but also the proximity of yourself. If you're in a store, if, you know, if you've got to go buy something for your family, you know, doing it first thing in the morning and just making sure that you're not, you know, there aren't five of you all standing closely in a line, you know, right. go to the self-checkout area, start, you know, go to the grocery store first thing in the morning. If you've got to get gas, do it when things aren't quite as busy. I think that's also helpful. And, and we all know that we should be washing our hands. I think we've kind of gotten to the point now where that's been so kind of ingrained, you know, sing happy birthday until your eyes bleed. Um, <laughs> you're so, so, so tired of doing it. But I also think about like brightly pigmented foods, lots of fermented foods, Absolutely. Um, still really beneficial, you know, staying away from sugar. Um, yeah, it's I, interesting because you, 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 you brought up stop smoking. Um, I've heard a lot of people stop smoking, cut back on your alcohol, you know, um, and again, it's just like with your kids, are they going to cut the sugar out? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Now you're putting them in a stressful situation and they're going to want more, but you can take a little bit out, mm -hmm. you know, like I told you, if you drink three cans of soda a day, which nobody should drink any, but that's besides, the point, <laughs> go down to two, don't mm -hmm. go to zero because you're going to increase the stress. And yeah. one of the other things, a lot of people are talking about the Spanish, um, flu pandemic of 1918. And what was really mm -hmm. interesting, cause I'm an osteopathic physician is, in our history, we had um, like a tenfold decrease in mortality and morbidity or, you know, or death and uh, significant complications versus all other physicians at that time. And we did a couple of really simple things. And one was we said, if you're well enough, go outside mm -hmm. and get some fresh air. That doesn't mean go to your neighbor's house and party. It means walk around <laughs> by yourself or with your family. And, and what they also did is if you were so sick that you or, or you just didn't, you know, didn't feel up to it, open the windows and get some fresh air a couple mm -hmm. times a day. And then because the lymphatic system, which is the system that drains toxins out of our body, especially sort of all these, um, like the medical talk, like helps get the bacteria and mm -hmm. viruses identified and then out of our system, th this system in the arms and legs really requires muscle contraction. Mm -hmm. And in, in the chest and the belly requires movement. Mm -hmm. uh, especially breathing and pressure gradient changes. So doing um, some like deep breathing and stuff can help. But one of the things osteopaths taught people is what's called the pedal pump. So someone's lying down and you just stand at their feet and you just get into a rhythm and you shake their feet. So all the fluids of the body mm -hmm. slosh and people are like, Oh, it's so simple. I'm like, yes, your body is designed to be healthy yeah. and to heal. And so 
we know that a simple walk outside in some fresh air with a little bit of sunshine, especially first thing in the morning so that you can trigger your melatonin mm-hmm. to start being produced. So one of the tricks, if you can't go to sleep is actually to get up, mm-hmm. get up and get some sunlight. And when, when it's the middle of the winter or I'm traveling a lot, I'll use a retimer, which is just one of those, you know, blue green light therapy glasses. Oh, interesting. It's so cool because I am a night person and not a morning person, but based upon my whole life, I got the retimer. I just, you know, I'd wake up in the morning, throw it on. And all of a sudden I'm going to bed an hour earlier. No way. Yes. It's amazing. You'll have to send me the link because I'm oh, yeah. sure everyone it's, will be asking so you about great. it. It's so great. Um, and it's, it's really, it's just re-timer.com. Okay. You know, and anybody who wants to use it, um, I asked them to hook up my patients and they gave them my, my patients, my, the same discount they give doctors. So if you just go D R T O M, you get 70 bucks off. Oh, awesome. I get, it's not an affiliate link. I get zero anything <laughs> out of it. It's literally, I was like, that's so cool. I can just pass this all along to my patients. And I have so many people who can't sleep. Mm-hmm. They're just starting to really get up and it just really helps. So we get them to bed with the tips we said, but we wake up. And you don't need to wait for a retimer to come in from Australia or wherever because it, it might not be coming. Um, right. And it is in a plastic saying. bag, so you might want to wipe the bag off. But, um, you, you know, get up and go outside and get five or 10 minutes of fresh air and sunlight in the morning. I mean, you know, as long as you can give some distance. Yeah, I think that's really critical. I mean, one of the things, and my neighbors probably think I'm crazy. So I have a fairly sizable neighborhood. And and what I've been doing is getting out with one or both of my doodles. And we do like a three mile loop and we do it late in the afternoon. And I'm finding I'm sleeping even better. The dogs are, they're exhausted when we come home because I walk pretty briskly. Um, And I'm just enjoying, I don't have anyone with me. It's me and the dogs. I'm one with nature. I'm outside. I've got my coat on or not, depending on how warm it's been. And it's really made a huge difference uh, for me personally, especially because now that I feel like I'm cooped up in the house, (laughs) it makes me feel a whole lot better to get out for sure. Well, and and I think what you said is really, and and for me, it works as I'm out in nature Mm -hmm. and I'm not cooped up. So one of the other really big immune, immune boosting things we can do and one of the things we can we have to be proactive about right now because of this whole we don't know how long this self quarantine stuff mm-hmm. is going to last for is chill out we need to de stress mm-hmm. and we need to model this for our children right that that's the other thing it's like all these behaviors even if you think oh I'm good I don't want to do it or I can do what you have to model it for your mm-hmm. kids they're going to they you have are so influential over your kids so and true. so really model it and the de stressing is so critical um, whatever it is, reading, prayer, meditation, breathing, mm-hmm. because a lot of these things will calm down the nervous system and take you out of that fight or flight sympathetic with all the cortisol mm-hmm. and get you to the parasympathetic, which allows you to sleep deeper. It allows you to repair better and it's immune boosting. So um, I talk to people a lot about doing heart centered breathing, which is really all you do is breathe into your chest and notice you're breathing into your chest. And once you notice that you're breathing into your chest, you think about people you love or things you love to do. It's I that simple. It. I love it. And there's biofeedback devices like HeartMath that can yeah. help with that, but you don't need to wait for that, you know, and you can teach your kids that, how to do it, you know, so easily. Um, and there's these little, all these little tips and tricks, but the, the bottom line is find something that you'll do for five minutes, once or twice a day, preferably twice a day, so start your morning off good, start the, you know, get ready for bed, prepare to go to sleep mm-hmm. by doing something like that. And then if you're stressed out in the middle of the day, you know, do, do one of your stress relieving behaviors, but it's, that will help so much more than worrying about what drug might be available in a year and a half mm-hmm. or whether or not there's going to be enough toilet paper. That's very good. Toilet paper. Yeah, that, without without question, for sure. <laughs> there are two things I invested in for myself. Like I'm someone who always struggled with meditation. I mean, I would put my legs up the wall. I would do anything. I'm like, I will try this. So I bought something called Muse, M-U-S-E. And so it has helped me become more mindful because it kind of it provides validation of whether or not you're literally in the right brain space. Yes. And a fun thing that I bought myself uh, at the end of 2019 was Brain Tap. Have you seen that before? Oh, I have one. I love it. It's so my, cool. My kids like to make fun of me. They're like, mom's a dork, but that's okay. I remind them that's okay. So I love my brain tap and I love Muse. I have no affiliation with either. I just think they're really yeah. great options. Um, I love and I would, those and the heart math too, if people yes. are into it, just because it, it's feedback. And I think that that's what's really critical. Like 
Um, I got, I was able to start meditating after I did Ashtanga yoga for a year and a half. And that's very physical yoga because mm -hmm. I'm like big sporty. I'm super cortisol -y, or at least I was. And it really helped bring me down. Mm -hmm. and I didn't, but man, heart math and muse and brain tap that it's just like, you can't not have it work. It, yeah. it helps, you know, when you're in the right state, so you feel it. And then you can get into it yourself. So I think they're all amazing recommendations. Yeah, they're great. And I would be remiss uh, for my listeners if I didn't mention intermittent fasting as being a really helpful, beneficial strategy that you can use, uh, you know, as you're trying to navigate this newfound, um, you know, COVID-19 environment that we're in. Now, I'd love for you to answer some of the questions. I polled my followers on Instagram and Facebook and got, and I tried to keep it very organized. So it's not too many but I'd love to ask you some of their questions that they're really, yeah. which are were often uh, most times were really nicely thought out. So for those that are healthcare providers, a lot of these are nurses that um, mm -hmm. are part of my tribe and they were saying, you know, how can they stay healthy? And I think we've identified a lot of those things, but I think their concerns were, you know, if I'm at work and I'm unsure whether or not I've had an exposure, you know, what are the things they should be doing when they get home um, beyond, you know, changing outside, you know, changing in their garage and washing their clothes and keeping their shoes Chicken outside shower, yeah. and all that? Well, I think the first thing to do is to at work before you go into work or as soon as you first get in on month, you know, is to find out what your infection control policy is mm -hmm. and what the policy for COVID potential COVID-19 patients are, because around us, a lot of offices are, I mean, the number one thing to do is if you think you may have it and you're not about to die of acute rest, shortness of breath, in which case you should call the ambulance, mm -hmm. stay at home mm -hmm. and call your doctor. Mm -hmm. And then your doctor should suggest what to do. But a lot of our physician offices in the area um, are actually having people call, make an appointment to pull up in the parking lot and stay there. Okay. And then they have someone who's got the full hazmat thing on and a properly fitted mask go out and test them and, if, and assess them. And if they are mild to moderate and they can treat them at home, they then take the test, submit the test and send the patient home with any recommendations. Okay. And that person has never come into the office. So Smart. even so prevent exposure at any, whenever you can. Um, and I think that that's, that's just such a good, you, that's why South Korea is doing such a good job right now they is are. they have drive-through testing. Which is what we need here and in the United States. They're trialing that in Seattle. They're doing it in Vermont hospitals and they're doing it in some of the offices in Connecticut. So I hope we, we can see more of that. And I would just know what you're supposed to do. And the other thing is if a person comes in coughing, one, they need to have a mask put on them mm -hmm. right away. And, and really, they should probably not be coming to the office. Correct. So, um, I think our post-exposure, potential exposure thing is really tough because if every healthcare provider who might have been exposed to COVID-19 were to self-quarantine at home for two weeks, we would have no one in healthcare. I was about to say, yeah, it, it's, it's a, it's a dual edged sword for sure. Yeah. So the big thing is start now before you're exposed, getting to know what your, your practice is going to do, but also doing all those self-care things, mm -hmm. you know, and like I said, bump up your D quick. Now we don't know what to do post exposure real other than the things you and I've talked about and all the common sense stuff. For me, I would come home. I would, you know, take my clothes off in, in an appropriately sort of separate area, mm -hmm. go take a shower with soap and water, you know, all the good stuff, not touch stuff. And then, you know, I would be doing things like my making sure my food and my fer you know, fermented foods and all my mm -hmm. rainbow of wonderful veggies is in there. I would get extra sleep. I would take my, I would double down on my vitamin D or if mm -hmm. I haven't been, you know, um, maybe do 50,000 three days in a row. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, is, could this for one or two people listening be a really bad idea? Probably. But for most people, it's very safe. Um, and it's, and I think it's, it's monitoring. And then I would talk with work about, you know, am I in a position where I could work at home or mm -hmm. can I, you know, we don't know. And there's so many what ifs. So I think it's really that personal care and personal hygiene piece. And, um, that's a tough one. I wish I had a great one. answer other than, you know, prevent it and yeah, uh, know no. what the rules are. No, but I think those are some great suggestions. Next, um, asking about cleaning products. Now, I did as much research as I could to try to get a definitive answer. And <laughs> what I found was... <laughs> 
the is virus, a this is a direct quote, the virus loses infectivity after exposure to commonly used disinfectants. And I, and I thought to myself, what does that mean? So I, I think a lot of a lot of us, um, you know, maybe we had been using really clean cleaning products for a long period of time. The Clorox wipes made a resurgence. You know, I, I, I kind of was explaining to my kids, I know we haven't used a lot of these products in a long time. However, given what we're dealing with, and I'm not going home with, um, you know, the, the cavi wipes that we had in the hospital that would probably kill just about anything. Um, for right. the normal average person, are the products that they find, whether it's hydrogen peroxide based or, you know, Clorox based, are those reasonable to clean the surfaces in their home or when they're out and about? Yeah, I mean, in I, your opinion. Yeah, I think that, you know, uh, in our house, we're, we're sort of segregating it slightly, um, not much, but a little bit is out and about, I'm looking at a little bit more toxic, mm -hmm. annihilate it for sure. But the, you know, and at home we're keeping with some of our natural cleaning agents, but I think that there's a, there's a variety of natural cleaning agents. Mm -hmm. And like, so I have a hand spray that has time that's been mm -hmm. shown to eradicate 99.99% of all germs that you could be, and vi bacteria and viruses like we, and I used to use it in the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, the thing it doesn't do is it doesn't get rid of like spores from mm -hmm. C. difficile or something, yeah. which is just an infectious diarrhea bug, but we have to wash our hands with soap and water. So one of the things, traveling is harder yeah, because one, you're going to more likely to be exposed. So you might want some bigger cannons and, um, and you have to do it quickly usually mm -hmm. because like if you're on the airplane or whatever. Um, but you know, at home, soap and water still works. In fact, mm -hmm. it's really good. So you can actually use soap and water. That's what they used to use. Yeah. So we're the using- The mechanical the, action of washing your hands removes germs, yes. Right. Well, I mean, even on the, the countertop. But yeah, I mean, I think we're making sure that we, we looked at some of our natural cleaning products and some are just natural sort of kind of like soaps, but not really. <laughs> and that's fine for every day. That's right. probably not fine for COVID-19. We need right. to be- or I should say the coronavirus that causes it. This is really a time to make sure what you're using is a true soap and or has clinical evidence that it kills stuff. You know, because there's certainly things that like our veggie washes, as an example, they're really nice and all, they're probably not good for cleaning off your countertop. Right. Because they're not going to kill stuff. Good point. That's a really yeah. good point. And then, you know, I, I, we've talked about this throughout the podcast, but, you know, exposures while we're running errands, shopping, should we go to the movies? Should we be in a pool? You know, I have, I have competitive swimmers. And so we've had these back and forth conversations about chlorine. Is it killing things? Should they be in the pool? Um, again, not being able to find great um, information on each one yeah. of those. I mean, I think all of us, uh, we're all, I always say I'm a realist first and foremost, you may have to go to the grocery store. You may have to run an errand, um, being smart about it, but I'm not sure if going to the movies is a great idea given the close proximity to so many people. But, um, what do you think about pools? I got multiple people asking about, you know, competitive swim programs and if being in the pool was, you know, because of the chlorine, does that kill? I was like, I don't, there've been no studies. I mean, there's right, right. No it really hasn't. I've seen some, um, posts, you know, from like, you know, and I, and where, where some experts are suggesting that swimming might be okay. Even Harvard is saying mm -hmm. that swimming may be okay, but we don't mm -hmm. really know. Yeah. And it could be the chlorine. It could be the fact that nobody else is going there. I think it really <laughs> depends. Well, you know, I'm like pretty sure like my daughter wants to go to the rock climbing gym. And I was like, no, no, and no, because right. for a lot of reasons, including mm -hmm. like if you get snot on the climbing hold, nobody's scrubbing every climbing hold in between people. But right. um. I think it depends on your personal risks. I think it depends on the people that you may also then potentially infect. Mm -hmm. And also what, what are your goals? If your goals are swimming because it's really fun and healthy for you and you want to stay healthy um, and you go to a gym that's you, you, or a pool that's relatively crowded, usually even with the decline, it might be worth figuring out some other exercise routine mm -hmm. for the next week or two until we can really make that next call. And I've been telling people to make a decision based on one or two weeks at a time mm -hmm. while still understanding this might be a six month gig for the competitive swimmers. I mean, it's, it's a hard one because it's mm -hmm. like, can you maintain your level of fitness outside of the pool at home or by oh, running hard. or cross training? Yeah. If it is, you could, because the thing is, it's, it is possible that you go swimming and you keep your fitness level up and you get sick. Mm-hmm. 
And then now you've probably lost more time. And it's, it, so it's very individual and it's hard because I'm, I've been a lifelong athlete and this is ski season, but now we're closing all the ski hills, oh, no. you know, but I also, all my other workouts are at home, you know, right. or out in the woods. So it's easier for me. So yeah, I would just apply some common sense in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, like you were saying with the store, is there a time where there's less risk? And with any of our, uh, any of our community things, what is, is it, is it more like a Petri dish or less like a Petri dish? Mm-hmm. Does it have a lid on it? If it does like a movie theater, is the ventilation really good? Is your pool got huge high ceilings and lots of ventilation or is it more, you know, compact? So mm-hmm. not, not a clear cut answer because we don't really know for sure. But I, I, again, I mean, I think that if you can figure out, if everybody in the country can figure out a way to, for two weeks, calm down and stay at home, we could see a massive shift in this. And, and, then, and then we could get back out to doing a little bit more. But we'll see. I mean, the way it's looking, it's April's going to be worse than March, unfortunately. Yeah, it certainly sounds that way. Now, for those that live in warmer temperatures, they were curious to know is... And I think you've already touched on this, mentioning that we, you know, maybe we'll see much like the the flu, um, the flu season where it kind of peaks in the colder months and then kind of goes away until the fall. Uh, we just don't know enough. Uh, someone had asked about pregnancy. Is it safe uh, to be pregnant and potentially contract COVID? And, and everything right. that I read, it, it sounded as if it probably was not as much of an issue uh, as some other things might have a bigger issue if someone's delivering or well, closer to delivery. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, the, the information that we do have available so far is, is a small number of people, of uh, pregnant women, and we do have information on their babies, so it was close to delivery mm-hmm. based on the timing. Um, and really, there's no evidence of neonatal transmission or transplacental, so mom mm-hmm. giving it to the baby. Um, I have not heard about fetal demise from it, meaning mom gets sick and the baby doesn't make it. Mm-hmm. We do know that there have been a couple of neonates, you know, kids within the first month or so who have gotten um, coronavirus. Um, one in particular was 17 days old, but they attributed that to the, pa- the baby being um, in contact with infected and very symptomatic adults. And the other one wow. was felt to be the same. So again, the highest risk are the people who, make, who, are, the, who are sick and symptomatic. It just doesn't mean, you know, just got to keep that in mind. But um, from the very limited data we have, we're, the recommendations are we should be treating pregnant women uh, very similar to non-pregnant um, children, and I should say women, <laughs> hopefully not children. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yes, that would be in a whole other separate issue. Right, right. But we, but but again, I mean, if you're pregnant, you know, um, especially in the early parts of pregnancy, just practice a little more social distancing to be on the safe side. Completely reasonable. And last question, and I already know the answer to this, but I just want you to say it. <laughs> Someone asked if the pneumonia vaccine could protect them from the uh, pneumocystic tendencies of COVID-19. I, 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 I thought I knew where that was going until the very end. That, that's actually like, a, yeah, I mean, you know, the pneumonia vaccine is going to help prevent you from developing a pneumonia if you're exposed to that pneumonia bug, but it is not an antiviral. It's not mm-hmm. a COVID-19 uh, vaccine. So it's not going to prevent COVID-19. Now I, I could come up with a, uh, a, you know, in a perfect world. Yes. I mean, I guess if you get COVID-19, you would be less likely to get the, a pneumonia on top of it, which we know can happen. Mm-hmm. Again, I think that um, the, the conversation about having a vaccination is very individualized. Um, but anybody who's having these chronic lung diseases are probably getting an influenza and a pneumonia mm-hmm. vaccine, and they probably should. Yeah. Um, and then, um, you know, we just have to continue to understand that this is a viral illness and bacterial treatments, including antibiotics, aren't going to work. Very true. And you had mentioned uh, steroids earlier, right? <laughs> Yeah, yes, yes, I had that because you know it's interesting. When I was doing a lit search, it was becoming very evident that there were strong opinions on both sides. Some people felt that it was reasonable; many did not. And I know that that will come up in conversation. Is this you know because it's an inflammatory overload? Is this something that's reasonable and feasible? Um, and right. you know, I know when we were talking earlier, you had said you know that would yeah, be a, you know, it's go. 
It's interesting because the science is showing that most people who get COVID-19 and get steroid bursts are doing worse. Mm -hmm. Unless they get a a very severe, like life-threatening sepsis or something else that requires it. But just treating, you know, respiratory symptoms from COVID-19 with it probably, you know, aren't the, isn't the best idea at the moment. And, you know, it's, it, I don't know if you'll be happy to know or not, but I do, I do talk a lot about intermittent fasting with my mold and Lyme uh, patients because we're so worried about detoxification and cellular recycling, but Mm -hmm. also autophagy, Mm -hmm. which I'm sure your listeners know a lot about from you, but the autophagy thing is so important. And with intermittent fasting or any of the other things we've talked about, the best way to allow any of the new medical things that come out to work is to have your immune system and your body working as well as it can naturally support your own self-healing mechanism. Uh, You have most of the power in this. That's the one really great thing is people can take control of their health with this COVID-19 pandemic, which will pass, and then your health will be even Mm -hmm. better than before it. Well, I know that we have taken up quite a bit of your time this afternoon. I'm so very grateful for your contributions. And I know that my listeners will want to learn a little bit more about you. What's the easiest way to find you? Yeah, the easiest way to find me is um, at my website. It's originsofhealth.com. If you add a slash coronavirus, we have a really great Mm -hmm. coronavirus resource section that's being updated all the time, including my cheat sheet on how to not get coronavirus and how to boost your immune system. It sounds like you wrote it because it's because we're talking the same language. <laughs> so be right up their alley. But yeah, originsofhealth.com. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Everyday Wellness. If you loved this episode, please leave us a rating and review. Subscribe and remember, tell a friend. And if you want to connect with us online, visit the link in the show notes.